Well, Mike, I unfortunately missed your talk yesterday, and I heard that you showed the email that uh, was sent to the speakers. I had the same idea because I liked that email. It had very strict instructions for the speakers, and I decided I will just keep that as my table of contents to be sure that I cover <laughs> everything that is asked from me. So it seems I'm supposed to talk about the success of the Delta project. So that will be the first part of this presentation. What will I tell about that? Well, why was there need for such a work? For those who don't know what it is, what did we do? Why did that happen only now? And why was it successful with the aim of learning from this for future work? So why was there need for such a thing as that Delta project? I often talk to experimentalists and I tell them what we do in the DFT community. I will only talk about DFT here, not beyond. What we do in the DFT community, that's solving these Konsham equations. And unless your pocket calculator that has one algorithm to do that, to, to solve any uh, addition, for instance. Well, for the Konsham equations, we have many algorithms. And roughly, we can divide them in all electron, PAW, and pseudopotential methods. In PAW and pseudopotential methods, you have to make element-specific choices for your projector functions or pseudopotentials. You can have different basis sets in all of these methods. And so these are just the numerical recipes. In the end, you also have to implement them in a code, and you have many varieties for this as well. That's a zoo of methods and codes. And experimental people, people from industry, they, they tend to be overwhelmed by this zoo of terminology. So if you tell them this is just one, this is all meant to solve one set of equations, their natural question is, do all these methods give you the same result? They solve the same equation, so they should give you the same result. We say, yes, yeah, we, we tested this many times. Every code developer tested such things. So then they ask, well, can you show me a paper where this, this is documented? And that was missing. So a quantitative paper, a quantitative argument to show that this zoo of methods does indeed produce the same result that was missing. So that is the need that we try to fulfill. It's not only important for experimentalists, it's also important for industry. We talked about industry yesterday. Is any company going to put money on a method where the result might perhaps depend on the implementation that you are using? No, you want to have physics and not something that is implementation dependent. So let's try to give them the right arguments. So what did we do for this? Just quickly, we start from a set of 71 elemental crystals. All of these elements in their experimental ground state structure, or if that ground state structure is too difficult, something near to it. We gave that set to a consortium of 69 researchers who all ran these 71 crystals with their favorite codes. And what did they calculate with this? Energy versus volume. So for according to a well-defined protocol, and so you have one of these codes gives you an energy versus volume curve. Another code gives you a different energy versus volume curve. Well, in principle, they should be identical. In practice, they are never completely identical. You calculate that gray area, the difference between these two curves, and see how large or hopefully how small that gray area is. Do that for one crystal, average it over all the 71 crystals, and that gives you in one number some kind of average difference between these two codes. That was done for not two codes, but for 40 combinations of codes and pseudopotential sets. And that gave this kind of matrix where everything that is yellow and green shows very small differences between the codes. So essentially identical predictions. So that was the conclusion of this work. The mainstream density functional theory codes nowadays they produce essentially the same result. 
So now we have that quantitative proof to show experimentalists and to show industry that the tools of this field have become mature. That was published half a year ago. Since then, well, if you want to measure the success, it has had some 6,500 downloads of the PDF. There are 11 citations so far, so that's quite good. And something I never had with any paper I published before, it even generated tweets. So it's <laughs> interesting to read what people, people I don't know tell about this. And somebody tells reassuring repro reproducibility and density functional theory. So that's indeed the kind of effect we hoped for. People will have more confidence in density functional theory this way. We seem also to inspire others. MD community next is this person wondering. So maybe this is a kind of approach that will find followers. If that was so successful, why didn't it happen long before? And that feeling you find at several places in the referee report. One of the referees was writing, this manuscript provides a comparison that is long overdue. Also, one of, of our co-authors stated at some point that this is something we should have done 20 years ago. Also on Twitter, you find similar remarks. Glad to see people doing this. So that means that this person is a little bit surprised that people would be doing this kind of work. So why didn't that happen long before? And the answer to that is in an analogy that I remember from Volker Heine. I very much like that analogy. He told us, well, what do funding agencies ask from us? They ask us to open new doors. That's the kind of work they want to support. And Volker Heine was frustrated about that situation because he said what is missing is once the door is open, funding to look behind the door. Now, I understand that frustration because in this kind of verification and validation work, the situation is even worse. You are not going to look what is behind a recently opened door. You are looking back to the room you are leaving and try to clean up the mess that you left behind. <laughs> so there is no funding agency that will want to support that kind of work. And therefore, well, it's never done. So why didn't did we do it then now? What was the, the trick how we could do it? And why was it successful? Let's search for the success factors. The things people had to calculate it in this work were very, very simple. It goes as basic as calculating the lattice parameter of FCC aluminum. So if that simple calculation is one of these little fishes, how does that survive in the ocean, the wild ocean of scientific publishing? The answer is you need many of these fishes. Each of these simple calculations, they get their meaning, they get their importance out of the context of all these other codes that have done the same calculations. So many small ones that make a big one, that was one of the ingredients of the success of this work. These basic calculations, they were so simple that all of our collaborators could afford to do this on the side in their unfunded time. You could hide from your funding agency that you were doing something useful. Second ingredient is this was not a top-down organized project. It grew from within the community. I always smile when people call it a project because well, <laughs> there was not a project. It just happened. It's bottom up grassroots. And you can imagine that something that grows from within is harder to stop than something that you try to organize from the top. There was a long standing need for this work, but then you need a trigger to get it started. And that trigger was a paper we published two years ago where we did, well, the precursor of this work. We calculated such a delta value for just three different codes, Win2K, VASP, and GPAW. And what you see here is a table that was in this paper. It's not yet a matrix. It's a list where we compare VASP and GPAW 
come to win 2K. These are the delta values there. We put that on a website and we wrote in the paper that if people wanted to calculate according to that protocol the same value for their code, well, send us the result, we will add it to that website. And remarkably, spontaneous data sets were arriving. So that website grew and grew, and then we realized, well, this is material that, well, we can analyze it better, we can do something more with it. So that initial trigger started the chain reaction of all these collaborators. Apart from a trigger, you also need a catalyst. All these small individual pieces of work, fine, but somebody has to do the dirty work to assemble all of these. And there is a lot of tedious and dirty work to do. So Kurt Lejager, the PhD student at that time, who was involved, he took care of many of these dirty tasks. And I would do injustice to him if I just credit him for the dirty tasks. He was involved in the strategic and scientific thinking a lot. He contributed a lot to this as well. So but without such a catalyst, well, the paper would never happen. Another ingredient, we always had a very good atmosphere in this collaboration. So this is one, the one picture we could take where most of our co-authors were available, still just one third of them. But you see many smiling faces there. I think everybody who was involved never felt this as a real competition between codes, as a threat to your own code. There was a very supportive atmosphere and that helped a lot. And to sober all of these things, one ingredient that was also important, that is that in the end, it turned out that for all of the codes involved, this, these delta values were small. We did some historical tracing and used older versions of codes. So we know that if we would have done this 10 years ago, the differences would have been larger. And I'm not sure whether it would have been possible to keep everybody on the same track if there are really noticeable differences. That's just yeah, normal human psychology. So maybe that's, that's a hidden success factor. So to summarize this part, what are my lessons for the future? If you would like to engage in a similar project for a different level of theory or a different type of properties, team up. What you can do as a group and with all the communication tools we have today, today, it's much easier to work as a group than it was 20 years ago. What you can do as a group is much more powerful than what you can do as a single team. Think about that catalyst. You need to have somebody in charge who takes care of all the dirty work. It's an important part of, of such a project and try to avoid the competition, make sure that everybody who is involved has their own uh, justifiable interest that you can work towards that common goal. So that closes the first part, lessons out of the Delta project. Then second part, in addition to reflecting on your own work, also provides a broader overview for a forward look, and in this case it will be a forward look on verification and validation. Where do we start? Well, this work, this Delta work has received also criticism. Let's examine the criticism. Something we often heard is this test set of 71 elementary crystals might be too small. You have only looked at easy properties, energy versus volume. And especially for the people who are interested in generating pseudopotential libraries with 71 elements, you do not cover all the elements of interest. So from this criticism, let's try to look forward. So let's build a roadmap on what a better version of this verification and validation could look like. I will from here on separate between the precision aspect, so the verification work where we compare codes with each other at the same level of theory, regardless whether that level of theory is relevant for experiment or not. 
and as a separate part, the accuracy or validation work, where you compare a certain level of theory with experiments. The needs of these two activities are different. Now, in order to construct that roadmap, my task will be very easy because in the process of writing that Delta paper, we had a mailing list where most of the, all of the authors plus some other interested people were subscribing to, and we discussed much of the future. Well, it was almost a year ago. It has been lying dormant for a while, but this might be the right time to revive these ideas. So what I present here is not only my own opinion, it's the result of a community-wide <laughs> consensus. And I will put that in in a historical line of what you find in the literature. So I will quickly jump through a few papers. You will get the handout, so I will not read all references. Just pay attention to the year and pay attention to the test set that in all these verification, because this is, will be about verification, but in all these verification studies has been used. So some people start from the quantum chemistry test set, the G21, 55 molecules. 2007, there was an example where a very uh, detailed assessment was made based on tree crystals. There is work where people look at high level properties with only two co codes and only one material. Then we had that paper from 2014 to which I referred before, where we introduced the 71 elemental crystals. And that was immediately followed by people who took now really seriously the pseudopotential developments, and they have different needs. So pseudopotentials need to be transferable. They need to work in all kinds of structural and chemical environments that you can imagine. So these people look at much larger test sets, 400 crystals, 650 crystals. So there is a tendency of going to ever larger test sets. Still, you can have some criticism on this sets of 450, 650 crystals. For that purpose, they might not work well. For that, they are ideal. So what would be the ideal minimal test set that you can imagine? That's the question we discussed in that mailing list. And the requirements that came out of that discussion are the following ones. You want to have a test set that really runs fast. Ideally, it should run overnight, especially the people who are working on code development and who want to use such a test set to maintain the, to, to prevent their codes from introducing bugs. They want to have a test you can run every night. It should cover all the elements for the pseudopotential generations. It should be structurally diverse, much more diverse than that 71 element test set, and it should be chemically diverse. These four main criteria you have to keep in mind. Which set do, did we arrive at? Well, it consists of three parts. The first part is let's do first an energy versus volume and later, as we will see, also other properties for all elements. And don't be too restrictive there. So we should go, say, up to americium to cover all present and future needs and put them in these very simple crystal structures, FCC, BCC, simple cubic and diamond, to scan several types of coordination from highly coordinated to low coordinated. That will give you for every element a set of four curves, which you can put really on an energy axis. So you will also have access to the energy differences between them. And that is surely fast. It covers all elements and it has some structural diversity. So that's the first part about 400 cases that really go quickly. Chemical diversity, do energy versus volume for every element of the periodic table in each of these six oxides to scan the six possible values for the well, nominal valence, formal oxidation state. Each of these oxides you can make in a crystal structure that has just the volume as a free parameter, so you can quickly make an energy versus volume through this. 
And so, well, chemical diversity is guaranteed. That gives you maximum about 600 cases. It's fast, it covers all elements, it's chemically diverse. And, well, don't overdo it. You might want to remove some cases. Nobody will be interested in, say, hydrogen with a formal oxidation state of plus six. So that's not relevant. So you can remove some of the cases that, that are physically absurd. So you will end up with something 400 cases, probably. If you don't like this bias to oxides, it might be an alternative to do also a chloride set next to it or to take half of the oxide set, half of the chloride set. There is some freedom there. And then the third part of that basic test set, again, energy versus volume for all elements. But now for every element, handpick a binary semiconductor, a binary metal, a binary ionic compound and a binary covalent compound to have some built-in diversity on bonding types. Also, that will be fast, cover all elements, it, and it is as well structurally diverse as chemically diverse. You should pay attention to selecting structures that are, although diverse, still rather simple. And if you take structures that do exist in nature, unless these FCC diamond and so other that will not exist for every element in nature. If you take structures that exist in nature, you will build in some bias of the test set to be, well, to be relevant for the situations you will indeed meet in nature. So that three, these three parts of the test set, they together form what we call this basic set about 1000 crystals that should run really fast overnight on a typical computing system. We expect that this is a kind of minimal set that covers structural and chemical diversity in a rather balanced way for every element. So that should be your ideal testing ground for pseudopotential uh, generation and for maintaining integrity of an existing code. It still doesn't solve the problem of you have studied only easy properties. So what would be the next properties you can consider? We want to have more physics than just this energy versus volume. If you want this to be something that is widely used, it should use tools that are available in every code. And preferably, it should be something that you can express as one number. You can still analyze that one number later on, but having something that is this very short summary in one number, that's valuable. So what could play that role? Well, you can repeat that delta analysis, but now for all of these 1000 cases. That's straightforward. That probes your structural and elastic properties, everything that depends on this energy versus volume, but now on a wider base of solids. For these four uh, crystal structures of elemental solids, you have these four energy versus volume curves with their energy differences. So you could express these energy differences with one code with respect to the energy differences of another code and try to measure the difference in energy differences. And that you can condense in one average number as well. That probes information that is relevant for formation energies. And you could take a density of states. Every code can calculate the density of states and do something similar as this delta surf the surface difference for two density of states curves. So you can express in one average number how codes succeed in reproducing electronic properties. And you can try to arrange this then in a kind of table. So we have this basic set of 1000 crystals and we have now these three basic properties. And every time you can put here one single number for any pair of codes. And obviously the way how it is arranged it asks for generalization. You can go to a somewhat more complicated set of structures that will probe other properties. So the suggest suggestions there are, why don't we add the 95 free atoms? 
might be hard for some codes, but well, if you succeed to do it, you have access to the cohesive energies of everything you calculated in the basic set. You can take a selection of geometry optimized diatomic molecules, for instance, 10 molecules per element and preferably taking pairs of elements for which a binary solid exists. And that gives you access to the physics of very low coordination, the limits of lowest coordination. You can take these same molecules but expand them over an, a given distance and that will give you for the first time in this story forces. Or you can take moderate supercells of the elementary crystals, put a vacancy in that and do a frozen structure calculation with that vacancy present that will give you broken bonds and again forces. So these are a kind of medium properties that you can apply to this medium set and the table grows. And if you then think about more advanced properties, we see on the program there is this talk this afternoon about optical properties in quantum chemistry. Well, why not then select a few crystals that are relevant for this advanced properties and calculate the things you need there. So that is a framework that can be extendable, but especially this part should be accessible for every code and will give you in terms of pseudopotentials, the guarantee that your pseudopotentials are extremely transferable if you succeed to fulfill all these criteria. In terms of development, because this is now just a sketch of what could be done, this has not been done yet, just the discussion about the idea is there. Apart from that, uh, scientific ID, there is a lot of practical work here that can be shared. And all the, the scripts for making, for instance, such an, the generation of the structures or comparing two density of states, this is something that can be programmed once and for all, and everybody who works with this could recycle that. Or you could uh, implement workflows in the packages that are becoming more and more popular to, to yeah to manage workflows, AIDA, ASE. So this is, this is service work for, this, for such a kind of project that can be recycled and shared. So to conclude this part, roadmap for precision studies. I described you a community consensus on what would be the ultimate test set there. Now just the work has to be done. But we still have that funding problem. So we still need to fight against the fact that no funding agency will cover that. Well, here, maybe we can try something. So we succeeded last year to have a project from the Flemish uh, Science Foundation that allows us, of that gives us money for one PhD student for four years to work on things like that. We could, of course, search somebody and let this person work. But I think the impact can be larger if we would try it in a different way. Why couldn't we trade students somehow? And if you have somebody who is working on a science project, but who is interested in verification of part of the methodology, this person could come to us. We can pay such a person, say, for one year and start working on the things I described. And so this person will then have a PhD that has a part verification and validation and part the or original scientific project. And because we can then distribute our money over two, three, maybe four students, we can maybe accelerate the vision that I just sketched in a substantial way. That's the conclusion on precision. I will say a few last words about accuracy. So precision was code versus code, same level of theory. Accuracy is one level of theory with respect to experiments. Here the test set requirements are very different. And I think we can take quantum chemistry as, an, as the example here, because there people have gone through a similar evolution. They started years ago from this G21 set that was very useful back then. 
but it became insufficient for the ever more sophisticated properties that people were studying. And so in quantum chemistry, you really see the evolution that people use dedicated test sets for specific properties. I think that is the way we have to go as well. So you could say for property Y, search, say, 200 crystals. The number is not unimportant. 200 is a good number, I think. 200 crystals for which this property Y is experimentally known and for which you know the experimental error bar on that property Y. And where property Y is reasonably easy to calculate with the method you have at hand. In making this selection, you should take care that you cover in a rather evenly way all the range of values for property Y. If property Y can be very large, there should be some examples of well, solids with that very large property in your test set. And don't put all your eggs in the same basket. You need to have, you need to have some diversity in that test set as well. In contrast to the precision test set, it is not so necessary here to have very fast calculations. This is not the kind of test set you will run every day. It's rather a test set you will work on just once. And so there is also no need to cover all elements because this is not meant for pseudopotential generation. So the situation is very different. No universal test set, but a hand-picked test set for every different property. The other interesting thing here is, in order to decide what test set you are using, you need somebody who knows very well the experimental literature on that property. So this is something where you can collaborate with experimental colleagues. And I really think it's a worthwhile kind of job to select your property of interest and think hard about what would be the 200 solids that would really guarantee that if I study these 200, I have fully documented the behavior of my level of theory for that property. Once people agree that this, the, set, the set you propose is a good one, it is going to be recycled and that work will not have to be repeated again and again. That will fight against the somewhat scattered picture we have now, where one person uses this set of solids and another person a different set of solids to analyze more or less the same properties. How do you analyze such a test set? There are some thoughts about this analysis as well. Don't take just the average values and compare them. That's too simple. You need some statistical tools like outlier detection. You need an unbiased mechanism to detect where perhaps there is a problem with the experimental values that you can detect only if you compare them to your calculations. Or you need to, an outlier could also be some unanticipated kind of physics or chemistry for which your level of theory fails. If that happens more than once, you need to detect it as an entire class. So classes of solids where your, where your approach works and classes where it doesn't work. You need to be able to detect systematic deviations because average deviations are one thing, but if there is really systematic bias, and whether that is linear or quadratic or whatever, well, that you need to detect these things. And you need something to detect the, of to, to quantify the residual error. So how far off is your level of theory, even if you restrict it to the solids where it works, and even if you would have corrected for a systematic deviation? Because that is, again, information that people in industry will want to know. So far, we often give them a predicted value for some property. And a hand-waving argumentation, it will not be too far away from the experimental value. Well, if we really want to engage with industry, we will have to provide them real error bars. And these kind of analyses could lead to quantified error bars for our predictions. I flash here a few papers from the recent literature where people have thought about such approaches. So you will find them in the handouts. And 
may they serve as inspiration for you. Looking at this, I also see a way to put this under a big umbrella. You know for sure John Perdue's Jacob's Ladder analogy, where you have the rungs of the ladder that lead to density functional theory heaven. It was recently we were reminded about this when in nature chemistry this new scan functional was proposed. Well, the kind of error analysis accuracy checking that I described, that could be a way to quantify, to systematize this Jacob's ladder picture. Jacob has another dream, a systematic investigation of a lot of properties with test sets that are well controlled, that are tuned to the property you are imagine you are examining with a proper statistical analysis and then you can see whether say a lattice constant or a band gap or whatever property really gets closer and closer to experiment if you go up the rungs of the ladder i'm not sure that this in all cases will be really happen if you do it in a full analysis that's the end Let's summarize the precision aspect and the accuracy aspect once more. So the precision, tedious work sometimes, but really useful. And even if there is no funding, we should really not wait another 10 years to go further in this direction. For our communication with industry, it will be really essential that we can document that the codes we are using are absolutely well correct at a numerical level. We have here a consensus, a community consensus on the test sets that can be used for this purpose. And I would like to discuss with you if you have students available that would like to jump into such an exchange program to get this kind of work accelerated. For the accuracy aspect, there things are less specific. So here we need property specific test sets. And this is a place where um, interaction with experimentalists is essential. So this would be, well, you could write projects about this kind of studies, I think. If you put this under the umbrella as quantifying Jacob's ladder, maybe this can be a community-wide project, who knows? The role of statistics here is important. We really need an analysis where statistics plays a larger role than it has usually played so far. And the end point of this kind of work should be that in, say, 10 years from now, a journal will reject your manuscript with an ab initio prediction of a property if there is no error bar next to that property. That's the kind of situation we should work towards. If you want to have the consensus document, so the, the summary of this mailing list discussion that I told you here, it's also written down in a consensus document. You can download it from there. If you want to participate in this discussion, if you go to this address, you can join the mailing list for this. The slides of this talk can be downloaded for, well, until I happen to clean that folder, you will find them at this address. Um, Tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, you will find the talk I am giving here and recording now on YouTube and the list with delta values, which is uh, a little bit updated since the publishing of the paper, you can find at that address there. That's it. And I will be happy to discuss this.